chickens like more than milk, it's worms. And so that's why I created worm milk. Today I'll be showing you how to create worm milk. Satisfaction guaranteed. Worm milk is not a real product, satisfaction is not guaranteed. I just love that intro so much I had to use it again. So here we are in part two of the worm milk tutorial. And in this one, we'll be going over setting up the actual uh, geometry and simulation of the worms and the worm milk. So um, part one went a little long, I think. So this one, I'm going to try to be a bit more to the point. And I think it should go pretty quickly because all in all, this is not too uh, complicated of a, of a uh, setup. Essentially, um, what we're going to need to do is create a bunch of tubes which are the worms, and uh, some fluid, which is the milk, throw it all into a vellum sim and let uh, Houdini do its magic. So I'll go uh, walk through this uh, node graph here and recreate anything I think needs further explanation. And uh, hopefully by the end of it, you'll be uh, you know swimming in worm milk. So here we go. We start off with just creating some points that we want to scatter some lines onto. So I take a grid and then I use Houdini's scatter align node. And you can think about this node as just uh, the Houdini scatter node, <laughs> the Houdini uh, scatter node, but with a bunch of uh, extra options for setting the um, orientation and scale and things like that uh, of the points that you're scattering. So you don't need to randomize the orientations after this. It just does it for you all in one node. Um, so scatter some points using this one. And so you can specify your total number here if you wanted more or less. This is basically your worm count. So I did 500 worms. And then here I'm just changing the P scale. So um, the scatter align does create a P scale attribute, but then uh, you can vary it uh, with this attribute adjust float node. and here I'm changing the values between a minimum of 0.25 and 1.1. And I'm using this uh, ramp here to refine the distribution. So to preview what that's doing, what you could do is add a copy to points here and pipe the uh, points into the second endpoint and just put a sphere into the first input. And so these are really big. Let me scale down this. Uh, sphere to point 0.1 and so here you see what this is doing and I'll just switch my light to headlight so we have uniform lighting here um, if I raise the max value I get bigger spheres if I lower this one I'll get smaller spheres and I've set this ramp so I have a lot of smaller spheres and then a few bigger spheres which you can see reflected in this if I wanted an even distribution I could bring this more over here if I wanted just like a few bigger ones, I could really clamp this ramp. So that's how you can get some variation to the size of your uh, worms, or in this case, it will be actually at the length. So let's continue here. This is just a little snippet of a uh, code. I'm not sure if I use this too much. I think I just use it for uh, packing, which I'll address in a minute. But essentially what this is doing, if I look at my geometry spreadsheet, all I'm doing here is adding a name and a um, piece attribute, which they function, they're functionally the same thing, but I think I used one for one thing and one for another thing. You, you don't necessarily need both of these. All it's doing is creating these tags for each point. So you can see I have uh, point zero is piece zero, uh, piece zero here. And so this just gives you a attribute um, that'll be copied onto the worm geometry so you can differentiate each worm, which you'll see in one second. And then I add this point jitter um, to create this stacking of the points so all the worms aren't right on top of each other when um, we do the copy to point. So let's see how that looks. So here we have a simple line just like I was doing here with the sphere, we're copying just a very simple line to each of these points. Um, and so this line, I, it doesn't have uh, any detail yet, just a line with two points. 
and you can see these lines here have inherited these piece attributes. And let us go to the next nodes here. So here I'm just promoting the name attribute to um, primitive instead of point. And that is because I use it down here for this pack node. And so I'll get into this in a second. Let's just uh, continue with making our worm geometry, but just know that these are just, I was having some problems with intersections and I was trying to troubleshoot it. And that's why these attributes are kind of weird or seem redundant, but we'll get to that in a second. So then I go ahead and lay down a resample node. And so what this node does is just uh, highly divides these lines. And you can see if I turn on the point display point number toggle here, we can see I'm having a lot more points per each worm compared to here. So this allows you to just to get an even amount of segments along the length of each line. And I specify that here with a value of 0 0.01. And so next we create an attribute that controls the actual width of the uh, worm. And so that is created with uh, the p scale attribute. So when you want to take a line and just create a, a sweep it or create geometry along it, you use the sweep node. And the sweep node will automatically utilize the p scale attribute. So if you just have a line here, for instance, and you put down the sweep node, and you set this surface type to round tube, you could uh, also pipe in a custom curve into this second input. For instance, I could create another circle and pipe it into here and control it that way. But um, round tube essentially does the same thing as a circle in the second input. So I'll set that to round tube. And here, if I do an attribute create as an example and set it to P scale, the sweep node is respecting this value. So you can see I can set it to 0 0.1, 0 0.2, um, and the size of this sweep will automatically adjust with your P scale. So we are gonna utilize that in this point VOP um, to create that varied width along the length of these worms. So if we dive into this, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and put my, um, display cursor on the sweep node, and then I'll dive into this uh, point VOP, which you can make just by typing in point VOP, same thing here. If I dive into this, I've created this little uh, snippet here. And what I'm doing is I'm bringing in the curve view. And if you watch some of my previous line tutorials, which I'll link here, you'll be familiar with this uh, curve view attribute. It's a zero to one attribute along the length of the line. And we can use that to drive a ramp that sets our p-scale. So you can just use a bind to bring that in and plug it into a uh, ramp parameter node, just like this. So there would be these two nodes, and you would just set the name on your bind. And then you can remap the values of this curve view using a ramp. And then up here, what I'm doing is I'm binding in that piece uh, attribute that I made on the points originally, and I'm just uh, creating a random value on that to control the overall um, uh, girth, you could say, of these worms. So you can see if I really up this, I would get some really fat worms. So that just adds a little bit of variation to the to the um, to the overall width of each worm. And all that is getting exported out to this p-scale attribute. And so if you hop up a level, you can see on this point VOP, if I pull this window down, this is kind of the profile curve of the uh, sweeping. So you can see it's basically the same width all the way across. And I just have this little worm hump here that I'm creating. Um, and so you could, accentuate that by um, raising up these ramp values, for instance, like so, um, and use this to kind of control the, the profile. 
and then you have this little like nose thing at the the um, top of the uh, curve here and that's kind of like the worm's mouth <laughs> and it kind of does look like that from the pictures I, I've seen but all in all it's fairly simple it's pretty much just a you know same p-scale along the whole curve with a little hump and this little uh, mouth uh, end there and you could kind of taper off the the back side too if you wanted to as well but I just have mine with a standard little curve there and so now this is where it gets a little weird uh, you, you usually wouldn't need to have these two streams here um, but I, I was having some problems de-intersecting this so I was using a methodology I've seen on CG wiki and I've seen it in a lot of uh, Paul Estevez's videos for de-intersecting scattered geometry and it's by using this um, found overlap uh, a snippet of VEX in an RBD solver. So if you just create an attribute wrangle and put I at found overlap equals one, and then put it into an RBD solver, just like uh, RBD bullet solver, I didn't change any attributes except you can say solve on creation frame. So it actually does this on frame one. But other than that, I didn't change anything except uh, turning off the gravity, I think. So, oh, I didn't even change that. So did, let me see what it is by default. I did turn off the gravity, sorry. So all I did was turn off the gravity and set solve on creation frame. And that essentially will try to fix all the D intersections. And you see it does. And in my case, it pushes them really far apart because I'm on frame 221. If I go back to the uh, start frame, and toggle this on and off. You can see it's just pushing everything apart to try to fix these intersections. And then if you keep scrubbing the timeline, it'll continue on that same velocity that it's set to try to de-intersect more and more and more. The reason I have this wonky setup here is because I was finding that um, with this width of worms, my de-intersection was still not it wasn't de-intersecting everything properly and my kind of hacky fix to this is i swept it a lot bigger so it, there was more severe intersections and then i ran it through this rbd solver so these sweep nodes are exactly the same except on one of them i have the radius at 0 0.01 and on this one i have the radius at 0 0.05 just so it's a global multiply across the width of all these worms and so then I pack them by just putting them in this pack node. And I make sure, if I put down a pack node, um, I make sure on this to specify the attributes I want. So I want to transfer all these attributes um, down the line. So just make sure to set those. Otherwise, once you unpack it again, you'll, you'll lose your, um, those, those attributes down the stream. And so you have to pack it before you put it into the RBD solver. So it treats each of these worms essentially as one uh, object, one point per worm. And then uh, once I feed it into this RBD solver, you can see I fix my intersections. And now what I can do is simply copy this position using an attribute copy onto my normal size worms. And so now I shouldn't, and I don't think I do have any intersections. And so just to show you the difference, um, if I pipe in my, um, my normal packed uh, skinny worms here into this RBD solver, and let me disable and enable. So it moves, it fixes some, so let's, let's find an intersection here. So here we have a blatant intersection I toggle on my solver. It does fix like that type of intersection, but I'm still running into like here, I'm still having some intersection issues. So, and like over here. So I think it is my best guess hypothesis for why this wasn't working was because it was just the tolerance essentially is too low um, with these thin worms. So that was my fix to it and it seemed to work. And then I just cache this single frame um, so it's not recomputing this de-intersect and all of this uh, 
previous setup. And so now we have this, uh, you know, mass of rigidly straight worms, and we're almost ready to simulate them. Uh, what I do here pre-simulation is I just use a match size to move them above the floor because I use basically ground uh, zero or the grid at uh, zero as my floor collider. And the match size is really good just for aligning stuff, any object to the, gr to, to the center of the world or to other objects. And so this, I just set justify Y to min, and I offset it a little bit just so it's above the floor. Um, so you could amp that up if you wanted them to fall for a longer amount of time at the beginning, or just leave it close to the floor so they start you know, hitting the ground plane sooner. And so now we unpack all of our worms, and I delete all the attributes I don't need. So I delete the uh, tag, and name attributes that had been created up here with the solver and at the very beginning for the packing. Um, and then I create a group for the worms to distinguish them from the fluid after simulation. And then I will feed it into the sim. So before we go into the simulation attributes, let's go into the milk creation, which is very simple. So this was the whole setup for the worm geometry. So everything past this is now simulation for, for this uh, aspect of this uh, effect. So for the milk, um, I had created just this little kind of stylistic puddle. Um, when I first set this up, I, I was using just a box and uh, I made this kind of amorphous blob kind of at a 16-9 aspect ratio, just because I wanted to kind of fill the frame in that first shot with this uh, rectangular puddle. So it's not maybe the most realistic puddle shape, but it, it does the job. And so to do that, I simply use a draw curve. And so this node, if you set the projection to ZX plane, you can just draw on the ground here. And so if I select the node and press enter, you can see I can just draw curves. And so I just kind of drew um, the shape I wanted my uh, spilt milk to be in at frame one. And so you can do anything with this. You could do more of a circular puddle or whatever. You could kind of create your initials uh, if you wanted to in milk form, which might be fun. So DTH are my initials. So you could do something like that. Really anything you want. Um, and so I didn't do that, but that's kind of a fun idea. And you can go into the draw curves and delete those by uh, just going into your strokes and pressing the X on the strokes you don't want. And so then I just use a fuse to kind of smooth it out and combine the endpoints there and a resample node to um, reduce the point count and also just smooth out any harsh edges. And then I use this poly spline um, node, which will close the, the um, line and create this solid uh, polygon and make sure the endpoints are merged. It's set to close in Bezier, so it'll close the curve and also um, combine the endpoints. And then I use a poly extrude just to give this a little bit of thickness. So I just extrude it 0 0.01 on the Y. Then I reverse the uh, faces because you could see since they are blue here, that means we're looking at the back faces and you can fix that with a reverse node. And I use the match size once again to just move this to the uh, ground position and make sure it's just above a little bit of the ground plane so we're not uh, starting off intersecting. All right, and so that's the setup for, for the geometry. So at this point, we have a container, essentially, which our fluid will be going into, and we have all of our worm geometry positioned above that little puddle. Um, so 
to continue on with the fluid to uh, configure fluid or to do fluid simulations in uh, Houdini, there's two main ways of doing it. You can use the flip simulation tools, or in my case, I'm trying out the new uh, vellum fluid tools. And so that was um, one of the main reasons I, I chose to actually add the milk to this worm milk simulation is to just uh, try out these vellum fluid nodes because these are relatively uh, new to Houdini. Um, why did I say it like that? Houdini. Okay, so the vellum fluid node will essentially uh, scatter points within a volume. So if I look at this, I have all these little spheres. So it's very much like the grains, if you're familiar with vellum grains. Um, and it actually is a vellum configure grain node. Um, similar to flip how you're dealing with points uh, before you mesh the points they're just points they're points in space um, and so i've set this to a particle size of 0 0.02 um, this will create uh, this will basically control the creation of how many uh, points you have in this uh, container so if i raise this you can see i'm only getting like large points so the lower you set this the higher res uh, of simulation you will have, but the longer it will take to calculate. And really, I think that's those are like the main things to look at here is the particle size. You can add some jitter just so it's not a completely um, uh, uniform grid. So if I lower that, uh, you can see it starts to get this more grid light grid-like structure. So I have this set to one and that'll help prevent any um, artifacts on the edges where it might have the weird stepping issue when you turn it into a uh, mesh. And then the other things to look at are these viscosity and surface tension. If you toggle this physical attributes menu down, you will notice in my video, um, my worm milk is fairly viscous, which as we all know, worm milk is viscous, and it was an intentional decision, obviously. But if you wanted actual more milk-like um, behavior, this would be where you would control that. So you could lower the, vis sorry, the viscosity and mess around with the surface tension um, to determine how that fluid actually behaves and sticks to itself or doesn't stick to itself. Um, for me, I just kind of ballparked these values and they were looking good for me. And so I went with them. You could definitely refine <laughs> the simulation that I did. Um, I didn't really mess around with, uh, I didn't iterate on it very much um, because this is YouTube and uh, you know we all have things to do and I thought it looked pretty good. So that would be where you could play around with the surface of the fluid um, controlling how that looks. And so if we look at the worms, those get, so these have the vellum configure grain and then the worms get the vellum cloth constraints. And I actually just used the balloon setup here. So if you do vellum configure balloon, these will add two constraint nodes. Uh, the first one is a uh, vellum cloth constraint. So that essentially determines the uh, how the surface of that worm will behave. And then the second constraint is a pressure constraint, which determines um, the squishiness, you could say. So the internal pressure of the worms. And I actually don't think I changed anything. I think I just ran it and it looked good. And we, uh, we said, let's go with that. Um, let me do a quick comparison. Yeah, I, I don't think I changed a thing. Um, did I change anything on the pressure? I think I just, I just sent it, you know, plugged it in and it worked. Um, there are definitely errors I noticed in the simulation. Um, some of the worms kind of flip inside out and that would be solved with more sub steps on the actual solver. So, um, that would be something to play around with. You could probably increase the pressure constraint here um, if you wanted the worms not to deform as much while they're hitting the ground. 
And I also played a little bit with the uh, um, tetrahedral constraints and um, you could try that too. I just found it was slower and wasn't really worth it. I thought the, I, I think in my mind, the balloon constraints are just a little easier and faster to set up and it works. So that's what I went with. <laughs> All right, so now we have the constraints of the worm setup and the constraints of the fluid setup. And so we just pipe that all into a vellum solver. And so to do that, what we need to do is just merge the geometry streams of each. So that's the first output of each of these constraint nodes. And then the second output, which is the constraint geometry. So we merge both of those together in these merge nodes. And then we just pipe it into a vellum solver. So the geometry goes into the first um, slot here in the vellum, <laughs> vellum solver. And then the constraints go into the second. Um, and so on the solver, I did dial in a couple things here. Let me compare with a stock solver just so we can see. I lowered the time scale just a little bit to get more of like a, a slow-mo. It's not really slow, but just to slow down the entire simulation a, a little bit. I upped my sub steps to three, and I think ideally I, I should have probably went with around five just to get a better fluid motion um, and to avoid some of my uh, artifacts on the worms, but it didn't really matter all that much. I thought, you could maybe get away with four, but three, I think, was pushing it. I'm kind of on the ragged edge of acceptability. Um, I added a ground position just by checking this box. It's by default unchecked at the origin. And then for the forces, I just lowered gravity to mi minus three just to also get more of like a slow um, fall on the worms if you keep this at you know, the standard uh, realistic 9.8 meters per second, or yeah, uh, 9.8 meters uh, gravitational force. It goes a little fast, I think. Uh, so I just lowered that a bit. And I upped the friction a little bit just so the worms weren't so slippery. Um, so you can see I did one and 0.2 here instead of 0.5 and 0.1. And I think that's it. So just a little bit of tweaking on the solver. You know, I always raise the amount of RAM if you have that uh, accessible on your computer. If you have more RAM, I would recommend raising your cache limit. Um, and that was all I did. And the real thing that actually creates the worm movement so that squirming and stuff happens inside this node if I dive inside. I added these two pop forces. So this is really what drives the behavior of the whole simulation. Um, and I only have this affecting the worm group. So that is set back here, as I, as I said, I grouped the worms here with a group node so we can access them uh, here in the vellum solver. So these two pop forces are essentially just adding noise to the simulation. So I have one noise that has a swirl size of 0 0.05 and an amplitude of four, and another with an amplitude of 0.3, or sorry, an amplitude of three and a swirl size of 0.1. So just a more broad noise and then a more high frequency noise. And that is what's cr uh, creating the wriggling and the movement of the worms, and that is where you would want to take the most time here to dial it in to get the right amount of squirminess to the simulation. And if you didn't have this group, essentially what would happen is your milk would just be flying everywhere because your milk would get affected by this pop force as well. Um, so the pop force drives the worm movement and then that worm movement splashes around the milk. You could think of it like that. Um, and so that is, that's it. And so this is the really nice thing about the vellum fluid is you don't really need any other special setup um, with this. It all can just be piped into this single solver node. So you don't have to do things like 
um, kind of import the worm collision geometry into a flip solver and do like two separate simulations. You can just do one giant simulation of all your vellum stuff at, at once, which is pretty, uh, pretty cool. So if I, I'm just letting this kind of play through, you saw that in the intro, but you can see as soon as the simulation begins, the pop noise uh, within the vellum solver starts affecting the worms and wriggling them around. And then they start hitting the uh, milk here and displacing the points. So we can see that happening down here. The worms are getting the milk. You could get some cool <laughs> close-ups of the worms here. And that is, is the simulation setup. The one part I'll, I want to address is actually meshing these points because I, I tried a couple different things with that. So after I, I cache this out, so you can just use a file cache node to cache out your simulation, I split it using that same worms group. So on one side of this split, I have the worms. And on the other side of this split, I have the particles, which is it's kind of interesting to see these um, without the worms. It's kind of an interesting <laughs> effect in itself. Could maybe could maybe do something with that <laughs> down the line. I'm, I'm just kind of thinking this is looks interesting is all I'm thinking. OK, so to actually change these uh particles here into a fluid we need to mesh them so we need to to turn these particles into an actual mesh and there's two ways of doing this and i've tried both here for experimentation houdini has this particle fluid surface which is uh, one way of doing it which is essentially like this all-encompassing wrapper node for a bunch of different vdb operations and so here we go. You can see we're getting some of this like stepping of the mesh and it the results aren't that great. And I could have probably dialed this in from like this distance. It looks fine. Um, but I, I just wasn't getting that great of results with this particle fluid surface node. And it has a lot of different options here. And it's kind of slow. I, I was feeling like. I don't have the scientific data to back up that assertion, but it felt slow. Um, so I didn't go with this methodology. Um, I went with this uh, VDB workflow, which is essentially w the same thing that's happening inside this node. If we jump into here, it's going to be um, VDB operations all throughout here. So you can kind of simplify things by uh, rebuilding it yourself and speed things up a little bit. And so to actually use the VDB operations, essentially you're starting off with this VDB from particles node. And so this will create an SDF or a surface um, um, a representation of your particles. And so if I type VDB from particles, you would just, um, okay, by default it is set to surface. And the things you wanna change here is you can just crank your minimum radius down. You could probably just set that to zero and be fine, but that sets the um, kind of the minimum P scale that it would look at. Um, if your particles are really small, it will start disregarding them. So like the radius by default is 1.5. If I had this set at 1.5, I would get nothing because this is a small scale simulation. If you had like a large scale simulation, you might want to not set that to uh, s such a low value for optimization. But in my case, you could just set that to zero or something very low. Um, the point radius scale, you can leave this at uh, one to begin with. And I kept it at one, but you could dial this down maybe just a little bit to get um, a more refined surface. And then the other thing to look at is the voxel size. And a good starter um, value for that is to just reference whatever you did right here on your vellum grains. So I did a particle size of a 0 0.002. So uh, my VDB from particle size is a 0 0.002. 
you could go below that potentially to get some more detail, but you probably wouldn't want to go above that. Otherwise, you would start losing detail. And so you're kind of de-resing or, or creating a lower res mesh um, from your higher res simulation. So it's just not doesn't really make sense. And I'll mention that Intagma has a great uh, meshing uh, tutorial. Maybe I'll link that in the description too. It basically goes over the same same thing for meshing these smaller scale fluid simulations. And so after you create particles, essentially what you want to do, I feel like I say essentially too much. Maybe I'll work on that. So what you want to do is um, use these reshape operations uh, to smooth your surface and then convert it to a uh, actual polygonal, polygonal mesh using this convert VDB node. So the general workflow is create an SDF from your particles and in the middle here you have smoothing operations and then you convert it to a mesh. And you can see if I just go a frame here, it does, th these operations by no means are like lickety split. But I think the results I was getting are a little bit better if I go over to this particle fluid surface. I'm sure I could get the exact same results if I really took time and messed with some sliders in, in this fluid surface. But this, for me, I think is easier to understand. You can see I'm getting a lot of like little jaggedy uh, edges and things over here on the uh, particle fluid surface node. And... Um, so these nodes in the beginning, what I'm doing is pretty simple. I do a dilate operation. So this expands the entire mesh. Um, and then I do a smooth operation. And the important thing to know is to set the operation to mean curvature flow. And that's, in this case, all I did was a dilate and a smooth. So you can see we went from this to this. And if I do the meshing and I turn off these two smoothing operations, you can see I'm getting a lot of weirdness here. So I'm basically puffing out my simulation and smoothing it. And there's more operations I could have experimented here. This was a um, fairly quick meshing, and I think the result was pretty nice. I still get some artifacts here and there if you look closely, um, but there's other... VDB operations you can use. Um, the main ones are under VDB Smooth SDF. So you can also um, try out like different filtering types. Those will be more aggressive. You can try stacking multiple different smooths. Um, you can do a VDB reshape SDF and set this to close. Um, after the particles, which essentially expands and contracts the surface. Um, so if you look at the difference, this kind of is another way of smoothing it out. So you could have, I could have potentially used that in conjunction with these other operations and dialed it in further. So that's actually looking uh, pretty nice. We're still having a lot of detail. If you go in, you'll start seeing there's some um, jaggedy things happening. But if you really wanted to eliminate a lot of this, like if, if you were going to get in this close, you would need to add more uh, grains to your simulation or have a, a smaller, higher res sim. But this was intended to be viewed uh, probably from at closest this amount of distance. And then after that, you can use an attribute transfer to transfer the velocity back onto your geometry. So these particles out of here, if I toggle on my uh, display point trails, all of these are getting a velocity attribute. Um, and by default, when you use this uh, SDF workflow, <laughs> this is getting a little messy here. And this was just, I was experimenting more with other SDF um, operations. Um, but by default, the SDF operations do not transfer your velocity attribute the particle fluid surface will transfer your, your velocity attribute, and that's set right here um, on the particle fluid surface. But we can do it just with an attribute transfer. 
And the important thing I think to set here is to raise your max sample count. If I put down an at attribute transfer by default, the conditions here, it's just set to look at one point. So you can increase the amount of uh, samples here. So it takes into consideration more of the particles around uh, the geometry. And so if we look at our mesh, we have all these uh, velocity trails now on our geometry. So we can use that to uh, create proper motion blur, which is a big component of making this these splashes look correct. And then the last thing I did on this surface is add a normal attribute um, and promote it to the vertex. And so I've noticed, I need to experiment with this more, but um, I've noticed that uh, Karma XPU doesn't seem to like point normal, normals, um, seems to like the vertex normals. Um, so something to consider. That's why I, I put it on the points so I have a nice smooth normal angle and I set it to face area and that'll help get a, if I look at the normals here, whoa. This probably will be hard to visualize, but let me actually go to my display here, visualize our geometry and set my, where's my normals, scale normal here under guides. I'll set that to 0.05. But by setting it to face area, if I look over here, we're getting just more of a smooth um, uh, transition across these normals. Sometimes if you do a vertex angle and, and do it on the vertices, it, it creates more uh, of a harsh angle and that can contribute to uh, a jagged look to your fluid. So. That's what I'm doing here, setting the normals to points and then promoting them to uh, vertices and then deleting all the attributes that I no longer need. These are just left over from the simulation and some of the uh, name attributes and such that I created upstream. And then I cache all of that. On the worm side, um, all I did was add this uh, random attribute because um, Karma XPU in the Material X, I didn't notice that it had it a, a random operation actually, uh, similar to like a random uh, VOP. Uh, so I just made a random ID on all of my points off the bat. And all I did was this little Vex expression to take that piece attribute we created way at the beginning and make an ID uh, attribute from it. And do the same thing, I just set my normals uh, remove all these unnecessary attributes, uh, sorry, all but these. So the asterisk would remove everything. And then these, this syntax here with the caret, uh, defines what attributes I'd like to keep. So I'm removing everything, but UV ID, curvy, V, N, and random ID. And those are everything I used in the shader network in part one of this video. And that is it. So these are the two streams, the milk and the worms, and all that is brought into uh, Karma XPU for shading. And I went over that in part one. And at this point, I think you have all the tools to create your own worm milk. So thank you so much for watching this video. If you, uh, if you do like these videos, please uh, give it a thumbs up and a subscribe. I haven't said that before in other videos. Let's see if that actually helps. Um, so thanks for watching and let me know if you have any questions or comments down below. Have a great day.